الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على النبي المصطفى المجتبى My dear respective brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First and foremost, I would just like to take a moment out to thank the administration of the masjid for sorting out this program hoping to seek the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just as we gathered today in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reunite us, if not in this dunya, but in the hereafter. Ameen Ya Rabbi. What I really want to touch on today, my beloved brothers and sisters, is mainly some of the causes of punishment in the grave. Without a shadow of a doubt, the abode of the grave is that which is inevitable. Every single individual who is sitting here today, sooner or later, he will be leaving and departing from this world, entering into a hole that is six feet into the ground. Whether you think you are too young to depart from this world, or whether you may think that you still have another 10 years, because you came across the hadith of the Prophet when he said, The average lifespan of my ummah is between 60 and 70. And then the Messenger said, And only a few go past that age. The Messenger وسلم, having said that doesn't necessarily mean that you are guaranteed to reach the age of 60 or the age of 70. We have lost a lot of youngsters my beloved brothers and sisters. I myself, in the space of a year and a half, I lost three young relatives. One of them was my younger brother, stabbed in the neck. Soon after that, a cousin of mine died in a car crash on one of the busiest roads in Birmingham, at the age of 24, same as my younger brother. And then a couple of months after that, a younger cousin of mine at the age of 18, stabbed in the chest on one of the most busiest roads in Birmingham, known as Coventry Road, which I think most of us have at least once upon a time visited. I buried two of them. The third, I was told when I was in Mecca that this had just happened. It shook me to the core, brothers and sisters. Tender age of 24, I believe the other was 23, and then the age of 18. All of them, they were extremely, extremely young. There's a reason why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, كُنْتُ قَدْ نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ زِيَارَةِ الْقُبُورِ فَزُورُهَا I initially prohibited you from visiting the graves. However, I say to you now, go and visit it. And if you look closely at this hadith, it didn't mention only the old, or only those who have reached the age of 30 or the age of 40. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is speaking to his ummah, فَزُورُهَا whether you're young, whether you're old, whether there's grey hairs that are appearing on your face. And even the woman. There's a strong argument that even the women should be visiting the graves providing that certain conditions are met. The majority of the scholars from the Shafi'iyya, the Malikiyya, the Hanafiyya, and this is one of the positions in the madhab of Imam Muhammad rahmatullahi alayhi. They all take the view that even a woman should go. And this is one of the evidences, and there's so many other evidences as well. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke to his ummah and he mentioned a reasoning behind it. He said, فَإِنَّهَا تُذَكِّرُكُمْ بِالْأَخِرَةِ 
It reminds you of the hereafter. Also in another narration, narrated by Ibn Majah, Prophet Sallallahu he said, وَتُزَهِّدُ فِي الدُّنْيَا It causes you to overlook the pleasures of the dunya. When you're standing on top of that grave, looking down into the ground, knowing that this is your abode, and that sooner or later, you will be entering into this hole. Allah, my brothers and my sisters, we're not going to be thinking about which color sofa we want to be buying for our new house in the future. Not that I'm saying that there's anything wrong with buying a house. As long as of course done in the correct way. Or which car we want to buy five years down the line. Which Mercedes or which BMW or which this and which that. This is not something that is going to be occupying our minds at the time. You're standing over that grave and you know that you are not guaranteed tomorrow. How many people, my brothers and my sisters, they kept on saying, I'm going to repent, I'm going to repent. I shall and I will. He went to sleep, he never woke up. Young and old. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in the hadith, أَكْثِرُوا مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَذِمِ اللَّذَّاتِ Be someone who continuously thinks about death. That which is going to destroy all of your pleasures. Destroys all of your pleasures. And without a shadow of a doubt, some of us have become so attached to the dunya, we are no different to a drunken man who has become intoxicated. And the dunya is at times compared to intoxication. You may not have consumed any drugs. However, because you've gone so deep into the dunya, it has left you shaken, intoxicated with the glitters and the glamours of this world. The kuffar normally, they don't want to hear anything about death. Sometimes at the da'wah table on Sunday, want to stimulate their minds, right? Begin to talk to them about the purpose of life. Take a look at their face. The moment you speak about death, it really shakes them and makes them think. This is a sad reality, right? I believe it was last year. Some of the brothers from Portsmouth, they asked me to come down and give a five-minute reminder. Allah, it was a long trip. Three hours for a five-minute reminder. Normally when I look at the distance and the productivity of that, it causes me to hesitate for five minutes, but then they told me a lot of them are non-practicing. And there are also going to be non-Muslims partaking in the football competition. It was a football tournament. And I was asking myself, what am I going to speak to them about? And it was around the time when Euro 2020, I believe it was, right? Euro 2020. And it was just after Christian Eriksen nearly passed out on the pitch. You guys remember that incident? Christian Eriksen, right? The slick midfielder. He passed out. And I try to make them understand it's live, just a game. Wallahi, I don't think I've ever seen kuffar show shock like that when I looked at their faces. It's something that they don't talk to themselves about. But it's a reality that you can't run away from. Me and you are both going to be admitted into that grave. And is life just a game? Throughout our days, we just what? Play around, right? It might be football, it might be basketball, it might be movies that we watch, it might be football games that we continuously keep watching. And by the way, I'm not saying again that playing football is haram, or that playing basketball is haram. However, when it becomes your daily routine to be heedless of Allah Azza wa Jal for many parts of your day, or for large parts of your day, should I say, 
right? What is the likelihood that you will die like that? I've been speaking a lot in the last couple of weeks about the husn al khatima, the good ending, right? We had two huge reminders in Leicester. I know I'm going a little bit off here from the topic, but I think it's worth mentioning. Two huge reminders in Leicester. I shook the community. The first was a Mawlana. As long as I knew him, he was always teaching the Quran and leading a salawat at my local masjid that is just a couple of steps away from where I live in Leicester. How did he die? Straight after the Aisha prayer. When we hear these kind of incidents, brothers and sisters, or we come across some of these videos on WhatsApp or social media, where a guy is holding the Quran, or the CCTV managed to catch someone at maybe 2 p.m. while everyone was at work, the masjid was empty. It caught him praying, and that's how he passed away. That was his last moment. And then we hear about the Mawlana, right? Who's always been in the masjid, as long as I knew him, right? Always at the masjid. Straight after the Isha prayer, passes away. Was it surprising to me, brothers and sisters, it really wasn't. Knowing that of him, it really wasn't. And then, I think a week after that, a Syrian brother passed away in the Fajr prayer. You do a little bit of digging up, my brothers and my sisters. Again, Salah was his life. He used to lead the Salawat, always in the masjid. The principle is, as Ibn Kathir mentions, وَمَنْ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ شَيْءٍ مَا تَعَلَيْهِ Whoever is excessive in doing something, he's very likely going to die like that, right? Whether that thing is halal or not, even if it is permissible, right? If, and this is just common sense and logic, the more you do something, what is the likelihood that you will die like that? Very likely. If I'm always on my phone, the majority of my time I'm on my phone. And again, I'm not saying that using your phone is haram. What is the likelihood that you will die on your phone? Very likely, right? Because that's how you spend your time. Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi He gives us some examples of a bad ending. One of the endings that he mentions is how there were some people who used to play shataranj. You guys know chess? And then one of them was on his deathbed. If I asked everyone here to utter the shahada, no one will have any difficulty. Isn't it so? No one will have any difficulty. However, it's not as straightforward when you're on your deathbed, brothers and sisters. Right? The talqeen, which means to get someone to say the la ilaha illallah and to hope that that's the last thing that he says. So one of them is on his deathbed. They try to get him to say la ilaha illallah. What do you think he said? Shahak. It's a chess move. It's like saying checkmate. Another man that Ibn al Qayyim mentions as how an individual was always busy with his business, making money. And again, having a business, there's nothing wrong with that. <coughs> However, if it reaches a point where this is now what you worship, you wake up to it and you go to sleep to it. That's what huh, your mind is glued to. What is the likelihood that you will die like that? So on his deathbed, they tried to get him to say, La ilaha illallah. What do you think he said? Hadi bidaatun rahisa. This is very cheap merchandise. Hada mushtarin jayid. This man is a good customer. And that was his last statement. You guys heard of Alan Shira? Alan Shira? Why are you guys acting like you don't know him? Huh? Match of the day presenter. Yes, he's still alive. One time I heard a sheikh saying, that there was this boy that he knew. He wakes up to Alan Shira, goes to sleep to Alan Shira. 
His duvet has a picture of Alan Shearer. His wallpaper has a picture of Alan Shearer. Alan Shearer, Alan Shearer. And of course, Alan Shearer is extinct now, right? He's become a dinosaur. Doesn't play anymore. We have other footballers, right? That we've become crazy of. It's almost become like a religion to some. Football. I don't think anybody here would disagree with me. I'm not saying everyone here has taken that as a religion. I have to keep mentioning these disclaimers. I don't know you guys. I might find someone pulling me up outside and dragging me, you know? Try to get him to say, La ilaha illallah. What do you think he said, brothers, sisters? I think you guys get the sketch now. Alan Shira, Alan Shira. And the examples are many. I spoke about it extensively in the lecture that I gave at Green Lane Masjid on the one who killed a hundred. It's on my YouTube channel. So many different examples of how people died. Going back to our discussion, brothers and sisters. The Qabr, the grave. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu Whenever the grave was mentioned, he would cry so much that his beard would be soaked with tears. His beard would be soaked with tears, brothers. And they would say to him, the Jannah and the Naar is mentioned, but you don't cry. But whenever the grave is mentioned, you burst into tears. He said, Inna al-Qabra awwalu manazil al-Akhirah. فَإِنْ نَجَى مِنْهُ فَمَا بَعْدَهُ أَيْسَرُ The grave is the first stages of the hereafter. And if that goes easy, then everything else that follows will go, inshaAllah ta'ala, easy as well. وَإِنْ لَمْ يَنْجُ مِنْهُ فَمَا بَعْدَهُ أَشَدُ And if that doesn't go to plan, doesn't go easy for him, everything else that follows after that will be horrible. And then he said, I heard the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, مَا رَأَيْتُ مَنْظَرًا أَفْضَعْ مِنَ الْقَبْرِ أَوْ إِلَّا وَالْقَبْرُ أَفْضَعْ مِنْهُ I never saw anything that looked more horrible than the grave. This is the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying that. Ali ibn Abi Talib رضي الله تعالى عنه he once said, we used to doubt whether the trial of the grave was something that was going to happen. Was it real? Was it not? We used to doubt. Until this chapter came down. What was this chapter? That which has distracted you is just wanting more and more and more. Let's be honest with ourselves, brothers and sisters, right? When you think about your life and you reflect on it, what is it that I'm living for, right? I, what, I, what is it that I wake up to? Am I just constantly worried about the numbers that are moving in my bank account? And it doesn't necessarily have to just be money orientated. Today you have what? Followers on social media. That which has distracted you is one thing more. Allah is saying, Today you have 10,000, tomorrow you have 20, the day after that you have 30, and then 40, and then 50, and then what? You'll die. What are you actually feeding the people? Is the next question. Right? right? The grave. Have you visited the grave? كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ You will come to know, indeed you will come to know. Right? And what is this speaking about? That, what, that which you're going to come to know about? The grave. And the trials of the grave. The punishment of the grave. One of the hadith, my brothers and my sisters, at times... Really does shake me. Is the hadith of Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Atadaruna mal ma'ishatu dunk. Do you know 
what this life of dunk is. Because there's a verse in the Quran, my beloved brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ Whoever turns away from my remembrance, then this person will have a life of dunk. The scholars, they gave different interpretations to what dunk means. In this hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he asked this question, قَالُوا they said, Allah wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is messenger, they know best. This is the response of the companions. Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, عَذَابُ الْكَافِرِ فِي الْقَبْرِ The torture of the kafir in the grave. وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ Then the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he swears by Allah, by the one whom my soul is in his hand. إِنَّهُ لَيُسَلِّطُ عَلَيْهِ تِسْعَةً وَتِسْعِينَ تَنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right, will send towards him 99 tanina. So then he asked, Atadrun mat tanin. Do you know what this tanin is? Tis'atun wa tis'un hayya. 99 snakes will be sent towards him. Li kulli hayyatin wa li kulli hayyatin tis'atun. أو تسعة أرؤس ينفخن في جسمه ويلسعنه ويخدشنه إلى يوم القيامة. And every single one of these snakes will have nine heads. And they will what? Bite him. Poison him. They will rip into him all the way up until يوم القيامة. وَيُحْشَرُ فِي قَبْرِهِ إِلَى مَوْقِفِهِ أَعْمَى And then after he's resurrected, he will walk to where the people will be resurrected and he's blind. And this is also what is mentioned in the Qur'an. فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَا وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى And we will bring you on يوم القيامة blind, as Allah says. And then he will say, "Qala, Rabbi, lima hashartani a'ma? Why did you bring me and I'm blind? Waqad kuntu basira and I was able to see. Qala kadalik atetka ayatuna fanasitaha wa kadalik aliyom tunsa." Our verses came to you. You, O Muhammad, and you, O Abu Bakr, Uthman, Sultan, Zainab, Khadija, you knew what was right and what was wrong. Our verses came to you. The proofs and the evidences were manifest. However, you decided to choose another path. You left Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on standby. Allah azza wa jal was saying to you, oh you who believe, and we should take that personally when we find these verses. As Abdullah ibn Mas'ud mentioned, when you find Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amanu, Fa'ar'iha Sam'ak. Make sure you lend it your ear. We take that personally. Why? Because we are people of faith, right? Aren't we people of faith, brothers and sisters? All of these verses came to you. You decided to what? Turn away. The other explanation that the ulama they give when it comes to this ma'isha al-dunk and this is what you hear a lot إِنَّ قَوْمًا ضُلَّالًا أَعْرَضُ عَنِ الْحَقِّ There were people who went astray, misguided أَعْرَضُ عَنِ الْحَقِّ They turned away from the truth when it was brought to them وَكَانُوا فِي سِعَةٍ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا مُتَكَبِّرِينَ they were blessed with the dunya. They had it nice. However, they were arrogant. فَكَانَتْ مَعِيشَتُهُمْ ضَنْكَا They were given a depressed life. ذَلِكَ أَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يَرَوْنَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَيْسَ مُخْلِفًا لَهُمْ مَعَيْشَهُمْ And that is because 
They thought that nothing will follow after this life. من سوء ظنهم بالله عز وجل And that is because of their bad thoughts of Allah عز وجل What was their reward? What were the consequences of that? They were given a depressed life. I'm sure most of you guys have heard of these very famous YouTubers, right? I've been using them as examples. You guys heard of Logan Paul? Huh? Logan Paul. You heard of him, right? KSI? Justin Bieber? The Beatles. I think some of the oldest. I don't think you've ever, you don't know it. <laughs> Stop talking nonsense. Huh? Okay, who are the Beatles? Who are the Beatles? <laughs> For those who are old, they know this very well known male music band, right? took a guess. Uh, <laughs> the Beatles, right? Yeah. Who are the Beatles? And I remember I sent this video to my little brother. He's sitting in the corner. I sent him this video. Because there was this YouTuber who compiled these small little clips of all of them saying that which is what? Almost identical to one another. What was it? A depressed. She was sad. Some of them are antidepressants. Also, flu tube, right? Across the board, brothers, many of these personalities, whether they're singers, musicians, stars, huh? they have a face in front of the camera, but then they cry themselves to sleep. Ma'ishatan dunkan, they live a life of depression. This is the reality, brothers and sisters. You may think to yourself, I want to be like that guy because he has X, Y, and Z. They have all the money, all the fame you can think of. Even he's probably now become bored of collecting money because of how much he has. But then what? What was his ma'al? The man's depressed. He's sad. He's not at ease. Ma'isha tandanka. Also, when you think about this, right? And I'll quickly mention this. Have you guys ever thought about why the sports industry is a billion dollar industry? Did anyone ever think of it? Or think about it? The sports industry is a billion dollar industry, right? Hey, what about the music industry? The entertainment industry, right? They are all billion dollar industries. The drug industry, billion dollar industry. Did you know that they call cocaine Britain's open secret? Even adult content is what? A billion dollar industry. The games industry, billion dollar industry. When you look at alcohol, it's a billion dollar industry. Why is that, brothers and sisters? They drink to forget we do, dhikr to remember. All of these industries, right, they are there to distract your mind and they feed off the sadness of the people. They feed off the sadness of the people. If you take all of these things out of the equation, how do you think they're going to feel, brothers and sisters? Look how depressed some of them felt when England was losing in the Euros. They say domestic violence went up. They're agitated throughout the week. They're waiting for the Champions League game. That's why when you think about it now, throughout the whole week, they're trying to fill every single day with a football game. Agreed? And then some of these footballers are coming out saying, we're being what? Violated. They're there trying to make money out of you. It's for entertainment purposes. Who do you think, by the way, brothers and sisters, is consuming these drugs? You think it's the local junkie that you see rolling around at the bus stop at Fajr's time? Only? Politicians, professionals, people with a lot of money. 
They need to distract their mind. They need to relieve themselves. Even though they have all of that money, they, my brothers and my sisters, they are not at ease. But then you find a scholar, right? Or someone with knowledge who has had so much what? Ease. Why? The man's at peace. Today, brothers and sisters, how long do we have? Huh? Moin. I think you guys will get tired. Huh? How long do we have? Yeah, but the attention span today's day and age is what? 15 minutes. And we can't go on for too long. Khalas, Afshir. If we get time, inshallah ta'ala, I want to cover six causes of punishment in the grave. Six causes. The first one is Adamu Tanazuhi min al Bawli wa salatu bi ghayri tahurin aw taharatin. The first one, my brothers and my sisters, is not cleaning yourself properly. After you relieve yourself. And the second is an namima. And both of them are mentioned in the same hadith. What is a namima? To carry tales. Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he told us in a hadith. After walking past two graves, Abdullah ibn Abbas is narrating it. He said, Innahuma la yu'adhaban. وَمَا يُعَذَّبَانِ فِي كَبِيرٍ They are being tortured in the grave, brothers and sisters. And that which they are being tortured for could have easily been avoided. And this is something very major in the eyes of Allah. This is why not cleaning yourself properly after relieving yourself is counted from amongst the major sins by authors who have compiled Al-Kaba'ir. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then said, أَمَّا أَحَدُهُمَا فَكَانَ لَا يَسْتَتْرُ مِنَ الْبَوْلِ وَأَمَّا الْآخَرُ فَكَانَ يَمْشِ بِالنَّمِيمَةِ As for the first of them, never used to what? Clean himself properly. And as for the other, he used to carry tales. When we talk about not cleaning yourself properly, my brothers and my sisters, right? And excuse me for mentioning this, right? But it's a reality we have to speak about. What's now happened is, because of what we have seen the kuffar doing, we've adopted and embraced some of their ways. Do you guys agree with that? Whenever I teach Bulugh al-Maram, the chapter of istinja and istijmar, cleaning yourself with water and cleaning yourself with stones, there are chapters. One of the things that I tend to emphasize on is how the religion of Islam is a hygienic religion. Do you guys agree with that? Even when the COVID happened, I remember memes were going around, sah? Of non-Muslims venerating and glorifying a toilet paper. I remember, subhanAllah, someone sent me, someone recording a safe. You guys know what a safe is? You normally what? Put your jewelry, right? And your money in there. So it records, it records, you think, you know, some money is going to pop out of this place. And then what do you see? A toilet roll. Only now you guys started using a toilet roll. And they began to say how well Islam is a hygienic religion. And because you make wudu five times a day, you're less likely to be affected by the corona. I don't know whether a doctor said that or some random guy. who has absolutely no knowledge of the situation. But the point of the matter is, right? It's a hygienic religion. The way you clean yourself, right? A Jew one time tried to mock the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal. Try to say, right? You've been taught everything, right? قَدْ عَلَّمَكُمْ نَبِيُّكُمْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى الْخِرَاءَ Indeed, your Prophet, O Salman al-Farisi, has taught you everything, right? Even that which relates to feces. Salman al-Farisi, instead of getting angry, 
What do you say? Ajal, yes. لقد نهانا أن نستقبل القبلة بغاية وبول ونستنجي باليمين أو نستنجي بأقل من ثلاثة أحجار. We were told not to defecate while facing the the qibla, the Kaaba and Quds, right? And to use our left hand and not to use the right and not to use anything less than three stones. Taught him. It's one of those hadith that we take honor out of. Why? Because our religion is complete. Right? You walk into the lavatories at work, what do you normally find, brothers and sisters? Urinating while standing up, right? Look how filthy that is. The man doesn't clean himself and he walks home and then with his family and whatever have you. Is that claim my brothers and my sisters? Right? I don't know why we're sometimes in a rush after relieving ourselves. Take it easy. Clean yourself properly. Right? And then walk out. So that's the first one. We are also told in another hadith, Prophet said, Ummira bi abdin min ibadillahi an yudraba fi qabrihi mi'a tu jaldatin falam yazal yasalu wa yadru hatta sarat jaldatin wahidatin fajulida jaldatin wahida famtala qabruhu alayhi nara falam martafa anhu afaqa qal ala ma jalatumuni. We are told that it was instructed that a servant from the servants of Allah Azza wa Jal is to be lashed a hundred times in the grave. And he kept on asking and asking, why am I being punished in this way? All the way up until he became what? One lash. And this one lash would cause his grave to be filled with fire. And then now when he gained consciousness again, he asked, why was I whipped? Why was I lashed? You prayed one prayer without the correct purification. It could be that he, was, he, did, he wasn't aslan, even cleaning himself properly. Purposefully he was doing that. Or it could be someone who is not what? Cleaning himself properly. Right? Or one who decided not to make wudu. All of these different scenarios would fall under that. This is why I normally tell the sisters, because I hold courses from time to time on the fiqh of menstruation. It's important that you learn. I remember at the end of the course, this is after 400 people joined, right? Even I was shocked at how many people joined in such a short space of time. And yes, a hundred of them were men. Because they have wives and daughters. And they need to learn as well about these very, very important issues. Right? So many sisters messaging saying, for how many years have I been praying not knowing that I shouldn't? And at times I would think that I'd done the purification properly, but I realized I wasn't. May Allah Azza wa give us all understanding in the religion. The next one, my beloved brothers and sisters, is a namima Carrying tales. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in a hadith, لا يدخل الجنة قداد. A قداد does not enter into a jannah. So you have a namam, which comes from the word namima which I'm thought many of us are acquainted with. Which means to carry tales, right? And then you also have qatat. Here the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that the qatat does not enter into Al-Jannah. And we've already taken the hadith of the Namima. What is the difference? They both sound similar to one another. Does anybody know? لا يدخل الجنة قتاد A qatat does not enter into the religion. Uh, into... I didn't intentionally make takfir of him, but... He's still a Muslim. Qatat does not enter into Al-Jannah. What's the Qatat? 
The difference between the Namam and also the Qattat, my beloved brothers and sisters, is the Qattat, he hears. A conversation taking place, even though he's not from amongst them. He's eavesdropping. You guys know what that means? Eavesdropping. It may well be that he's cleaning the masjid and there are people sitting in the corner. They don't want to be sharing their conversation with him. So what happens? He eavesdrops. Oh, they're speaking about so and so. Of course, yes, they shouldn't be speaking about anybody in a negative light. What does he do? He takes this information and goes to the person they're speaking about and says, guess what? As I was hoovering the masjid, right? I overheard them saying X, Y, and Z about you. As for the namam, the one who carries tales, namima, it may well be that we are all sitting together, we are having a conversation, and then someone's mentioned that we shouldn't be speaking about. What do I do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take the information and you go to the person who's being spoken about and you tell him, look, I'm informing you. And namam is of that kind. al qatat is that which we mentioned. Ibn Abd al-Bar, he mentions that Yahya ibn Abi Kathir, rahmatullahi alayhi, said, Yufsidu al-Nammamu, wal-Kadhabu fi sa'atin, ma la yufsidu al-Sahiru fi sana. What is one of the jobs of a Sahir? What did Allah Azza wa Jal tell us in the Quran that the Sahir, that the magician does? When the two angels, Harut and Marut, came to the people of Babylon as a trial, right? They came to teach them magic. However, they would come with a what? A huge disclaimer. We are a trial to you guys. Don't commit kufr. What would they teach them? Does anybody know? They would teach them how to separate between husband and wife. So what does the Sahir do? It separates between people. What is Yahya ibn Abi Kathir saying here? The Namam, the guy who carries tales, right? And the Kadhab, the compulsive liar. They corrupt and destroy in one hour that which maybe the Sahir needs to carry out in a whole year. A whole year he's trying to separate me between husband and wife and he's trying to separate between father and son, mother and daughter. But then a mum, one hour. That's maybe even an understatement in today's day and age. How long do you think a mum needs with the era of social media to cause corruption? Not just between two people, right? But actually between two nations. A war can take place because of what? A tweet. Would you guys agree with that? How many times is Donald Trump about to start a war with? What's the guy's name? Hong King Kong? Huh? North Korea? What was his name? King, I was close. Right? How many times a war needed to place? Relations are cut because of a tweet. I remember there was a time Saudi Arabia cut ties with Canada, because of what one of them said on Twitter. At least Kadalik is in the song. With the era of social media, WhatsApp, you send one message, Wallahi, brothers and sisters, it could destroy the relationship between what families in a heartbeat so quickly. We're not living in an era of having husnul nun, giving people the benefit of the doubt. We're living in a time and era of cancelling people. You can't see Lunak. Huh? Straight away. Very unforgiving we have become, especially on social media. Or verify the information. Double check it, la. Straight away. A very powerful statement of Imam al-San'ani, rahmatullahi alayhi, says, Undur fi hikmatillah. Look at the wisdom of Allah. وَمَحَبَّتِهِ لِاجْتِمَاعِ الْقُلُوبِ And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves for the hearts to come together. كَيْفَ حَرَّمَ النَّمِيمَ How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made النَّمِيمَ حَرَامٍ Even though 
It is sidq, even though it's the truth. When that person left that gathering and went to the one who was being spoken about or being backbitten, was he telling the truth or was he lying? He was telling the truth. And even then it's been made haram. لِمَا فِيهَا مِنْ إِفْسَادِ الْقُلُوبِ Because it causes the hearts to have animosity towards one another. وَتَوْلِيدِ الْعَدَاوَةِ وَالْوَحْشَةِ وَأَبَاحَ الْكَذِبِ And also what? It causes this harmony amongst the people. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed one to lie. وَأَبَاحَ الْكَذِبِ But in which scenario? Huh, brothers and sisters? لِإِصْلَاحِ ذَاتِ الْبَيْنِ Why? Right? When you want to solve the problems between two individuals who may have fallen out with one another. It's one of the three scenarios where lying is allowed. Why? In order to bring the hearts close. When it was, that which is going to separate between the hearts and cause animosity, it was made haram. But something that is haram, like kadib, was made, what? Allowed. Ijtima' al qulub in order to bring the hearts close. وَإِذْهَابِ الْعَدَاوَةِ a principle that I have, my beloved brothers and sisters, principle in life. The one who brings you tales about others, it's only a matter of time that he spreads tales about you. Do you guys agree with that? مَن نَمَّ إِلَيْكْ نَمَّ عَلَيْكْ As Hassan al-Basri mentioned. Today he's saying, so and so said X, Y and Z and whatever have you, and he's saying this and he's saying that. It's only a matter of time before he stabs in the back. So how do we deal with this kind of individual. You may want to take out your pens and your papers. Wallah, I believe if this was applied, there would be so much good in society. And it would prevent so many problems, so many situations where people fall out with one another. Ibn Qudam, rahmatullahi alayhi, and his mukhtasar of minhaj al-qasideen. He says, وَكُلُّ مَنْ نَقَلَ إِلَيْكَ النَّمِيمَةِ Every individual who brings you tales about others, right? He says, so-and-so done that, and so-and-so done this, right? So-and-so said this about you, right? Upon you is to do six things. Upon you is to do six things. Number one, أَنْ لَا يُصَدِّقَ النَّاقِلَ لِأَنَّ النَّمَّامَ فَاسِقٌ مَرْدُودُ الشَّهَادَةً That you don't believe what this individual is saying. Straight away. Why? Because this person who is carrying tales is a fasiq. He's a transgressor. He is partaking in some of the, or should I say, one of the most major sins possible because of the corruption that it causes. There are some major sins that is what? Huh? Limited to maybe just yourself. Or two people. This is now what? Causing problems and corruption upon, amongst many. Shouldn't believe him. Because he's a fasiq. Mardudu shahada. This person's testimony in court will be rejected. And in Islamic court, they won't believe him. Or they won't accept anything that he says. Because of him committing fisk. Thani. Number two. An yanhahu an dalika wa yansahu. You should forbid him from doing this. And you should advise him. Number three, You should hate him for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And because he is despised by Allah Azza wa Jal. Due to him partaking in this filthy evil sin. Number four, That he shouldn't think bad of his brother. This person now that he's talking to you about, you shouldn't start having bad assumptions of him. And that is because what? You can't accept what this individual says. Even though it will burn. Right? It will make you feel at, or should I say, unease. It will cause you discomfort. You'll be thinking about it all night. How can that individual say X, Y, and Z? Number five. أَنْ لَا يَحْمِلَهُ مَا حُكِيَ لَهُ عَلَى التَّجَسُّسِ وَالْبَحْثِ 
This should not cause you now to start spying. This should not lead you now to start spying on that individual. Now that this has been said, you send people, oh, go and double check. Does he really say that? Go and ask him. Try to act like you're on his side. And that you're his friend. See whether he says that. And that is because Allah said, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُ Do not spy on one another. And number six, أَن لَا يَرْضَى لِنَفْسِهِ مَا نَهَا عَنْهُ النَّمَّامَ فَلَا يَحْكِي نَمِيمَتَهُ you should not fall into that which you advise this tale teller of. You may say to him now, Akhi, listen, what you've done is wrong, you shouldn't do this. But then, you go to your wife or you go to your brothers and sisters and you start saying, oh, I can't believe what that guy said about me. He just prohibited that individual from not doing this. And you shouldn't be believing him. You should not relate that which is being said. May Allah give us a tawfiq to act upon that. It's not easy. Right? These six points are really what? Pushing buttons. It's really putting us to the test. And on the ropes, if you want to call it. Number three. And we may have to conclude with this. It was reported by Imam Ahmed rahmatullahi alayhi and also at Tabrani on the authority of Ya'la ibn Shababa radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one time walked past a grave يُعَذَّبُ sahibu, and the one in the grave was being punished Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِنَّ هَذَا كَانَ يَأْكُلُ لُحُومَ النَّاسِ this individual, he used to eat the flesh of the people. And because of that, he's now being punished in the grave. The third point, my brothers and my sisters, that which we are covering is backbiting. For those who don't know what backbiting means, Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said one time to his companions, Do you know what ghiba is? They said, Allah wa Rasuluhu knows best. Qal, dhikruka akhaka bima yakrahu. To say about your brother that which he dislikes. So the companions, they said, Afara'ayta in kana fi akhi ma'akul. What if that which I'm saying about him is actually the truth? Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in kana fi ma taqul, faqad irtabta. If that which you are saying about him is the truth, then you've backbited him. If it's not the truth, faqad bahatta. You've slandered him. النوي رحمة الله عليه said كل ما أفهمت به غيرك نقصان مسلم فهي غيبة أو فهو غيبة whenever you express your brother in a negative light to another individual this is a غيبة sometimes you take sly shots right at a Muslim صح I'm not speaking about a kafir. I'm speaking about a Muslim. This is why he said, كُلُّ مَا أَفْهَمْتَ بِهِ غَيْرَكَ نُقْصَانَ مُسْلِمٍ فَقَدْ اِخْتَبْتَ Expressing negativity about a Muslim brother. Sometimes he may be with a wink. Huh? With expression. Straight to the person who's sitting in front of you takes away from that what? That he's like X, Y, and Z. To portray them in a negative light. Right? Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Lamma urija bi maratu bi qawmin lahum alfarun min nuhas. When I was taken on the night journey, I went past a group of people who had nails made out of metal. Yakhmishuna mujuhahum wa sudurahum. What were they doing? They were scratching their faces. With these metal uh, nails and their chests as well. فَقُلْتُ مَنْ هَؤُلَاءِ يَا جِبْرِيلِ I asked, who are they, O Jibreel? قَالْ هَؤُلَاءِ الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ لُحُومَ النَّاسِ وَيَقَعُونَ فِي عَرَاضِهِمْ They're the ones who eat the flesh of people. And they rip the honor of the people into shreds. 
And again, when somebody comes and backbites you, sorry, when someone comes to you and says that so and so is backbiting you, how should you respond? Hassan al Basri rahmatullahi alayhi said, Marhaban bi Hassanatin lam af'alha. Walam at'ab fiha. Walam yatkhul fiha ujbun wa lahriha. Welcome to this good deed that I didn't do. And I didn't strive and get tired in carrying it out. And also, this good deed that inshallah ta'ala that I will now receive on the day of resurrection hasn't been affected with self-amazement and showing off. A battle that every single one of us has when we do acts of worship, especially in public. Am I doing it for the sake of Allah? Am I not? However, you're going to be getting that good deed, right? You didn't have to strive for it. You didn't have to show off. It just came to you like that. Hassan al Basri would say, Marhaban, welcome. Shaykh al Islam Taym, rahmatullahi alayhi, was asked about a woman who prays at night and fasts in the day. And she also would what? Complete the Quran all the time. وتختم القرآن ولكن لا تدع أحدا من غيبة There's not a person except that she would speak about and backbite وقد نصحت بلا فائدة And she's been advised She's not receptive to it She doesn't change He said لعل الله سخرها لتعمل لغيرها Perhaps Allah سبحانه وتعالى Sent her to do all of these good deeds so she can work for others. What a response. She's doing all of these good deeds, which many people would struggle. Let's be honest here. Is it easy to stand up in the night? Is it easy to fast in the day, on a hot summer's day, brothers and sisters? It's not. And to complete the Quran and then to complete it again and again. All of these good deeds that we do, it could be that huh? it's going to be on someone else's scale of good deeds. Ibn Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi, he called this aswa'u anwa'il karam, the worst type of generosity. The worst type of generosity. Aswa'u anwa'il karam. Huwa karamuka fi ihidai hasanatika lil akhirin. It is you gifting your good deeds to others. It's the worst type of what? Generosity. And it's even worse huh, when you backbite a righteous person. The more righteous that individual is, the worse that sin becomes. The worse that sin becomes. وَلِذَلِكَ تَغَلَّطِتِ الْغِيبَةُ بِحَسَبِ حَالِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فكل ما كان أعظم إيمانا كان اغتيابه أشد. depending on how righteous he is, the more righteous, the more worse. and this is why it shocks me at times how some have taken this as a religion to speak about scholars, right? just because he doesn't agree with your sheikh, they rip into him. or a person who has never gone out to study, he's sitting in a cafe making takfir of this guy. Making tabdi' of that guy, he calls him an innovator, this guy's a kafir, he's never ever studied his religion. Takes all of them and just what? The scholars of today, they're all sellouts. Look at this mass huh? accusation. It's mass accusation. That's a very big statement. The scholars of today, they're sellouts. Huh? Or the scholars of today, they're all harsh, rough, and tough. Not only are you saying bad stuff about them behind their back, but you're also what generalizing, making these sweeping statements. I've been told to stop at 11. I'll mention this as the last one, inshallah ta'ala. And I think it's very, very convenient. Al kathbatu allati tablughul afaq. Number five, brothers and sisters, is. Are we on number five? Huh? Four. Time. Al kathbatu allati tablughu al afaq. The lie that reaches the other side of the world 
or should I say the four corners of the world? There is a very famous hadith. It is the hadith of Samurata ibn Jundub radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Right? When the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was taken on an experience where he saw so many people being punished and this was the punishment of the grave. As the scholars mentioned when commenting on this hadith, one of those that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came across was الرجل الذي يشرشر شدقه إلى قفاه ومنخره إلى قفاه وعينه إلى قفاه فإنه الرجل يغدو من بيته فيكذب الكذبة تبلغ الأفاق There was a man, my brothers and my sisters who had a hook stuck in his mouth and he would be ripped all the way to the back of his head right and he would also be inserted in his eyes and the same would happen and likewise on his neck same would happen and when this now or should I say the next thing that will happen after that is the other side of the face and by that time this one has already healed and gone, gone back to normal and this will go on and on, go on and, and on. So the Messenger of Allah asked, who is he? He's the one who walks out of his house. He spreads a lie that reaches the other side of the world. Sometimes I look at this hadith and I think, when the Sahaba heard it, what went through their mind? Right? They're in the middle of the Arabian desert and they're being told this. One line that reaches the other side of the world. But when we look at today's day and age, uh, what do you think, brothers and sisters? Slander, lies, all sorts, you name it. Right? Those, what do they call them? Huh? Twitter warriors who are trigger happy with the Twitter fingers. Huh? They'll never ever come out in real life, speak like that. But behind the keyboard, he's a warrior. Spreads this lie, says this about that. And he reaches the other side of the world in a heartbeat. And people believe it. Like I mentioned earlier, there isn't something called what husn al in today's day and age. It has diminished. Having good thoughts of the people and double checking, huh? giving the people the benefit of doubt. That's a whole topic in within this stuff. One time I gave a whole lecture on what? Just husn al having good thoughts of the people and how this what allows you to be at peace at night when you go to sleep huh? and how this also what treats your heart and the scholars they mention if the only benefit that we could take away from having good thoughts of the people is the fact that you're able to go to sleep at night with peace then that would be enough and then the only bad thing that we could say about having evil thoughts is the fact that you can't go to sleep at peace and it would be enough to say that having bad thoughts is an evil trait I think we'll have to stop there the other one was a zina that I wanted to mention also there was aklu riba taking usury interest and the other one was al ghulul min al ghanima to take from the war booty the spoils of war right before it has been attributed uh, distributed accordingly right and how this applies today, right, for those who collect money. And what Abu Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu al-Ansari mentioned when the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent him to go and collect the zakawat, the charities, how scared he became. But I've gone well over the time. And I hope I haven't bored you all, I've tired you guys out. I remember a couple of years ago I was doing some research on the average time, uh, the average attention span. It was 15 minutes at a time. And then it became 12. Allahu alam how many minutes it is today, especially with the millennials. We are living in the era of reels, right? The social media companies, they've realized that if you want to grab someone's attention, then grab it with 30 seconds. That's why you have the reels. Maybe an hour's lecture, he won't pay attention. May Allah honor every single one of you guys for 
taken a time out to attend today's gathering. Barakallahu feekum, ahsan Allah ilaykum. Now open up to questions, inshallah. Uh, the first two or three questions, if you can take the first two or three related to the topic, either death, grave, or the day of judgment, and then after that we can open up to um, other questions if Sir doesn't mind, inshallah. Uh, yeah, that's in two minutes, huh? By the way, brothers, I'm not a mufti, yeah? If I don't know the answer, I'll say Allahu Alam. As Abdullah ibn Mas'ud he said, Kan ya'lamu shayin fal yaqul bihi. Wa man kana la ya'lamu shayin fal yaqul Allahu Alam. If you know something, then answer it. You don't say Allahu Alam. And that's half the knowledge. Ah, uh, tafadal. I'll take you up. You don't get to answer, ask a question. I'm just joking with you. Ah, uh, tafadal. Sorry? Huh? No, it's hard, hard. Okay, so you're saying you're saying something about um, I think uh, the, the backbiting or, or being a slander of some of scholars or someone who makes no pious. It made me reflect sometimes in some discussions between brothers because I didn't know this, but subhanAllah, I feel you confirmed it. Which was, I've always heard stories about those who are pleasing to Allah and they're pleasing to Allah. Is it fair to say that those who are more pleasing in the sight of Allah, if they're insulted, then is what makes that that would be what makes that worse by them doing so. So the brother is asking. I think everybody had the question. Yeah, I hope the mic caught it. Right, about when somebody is more closer to Allah Azza wa Jal, right, insulting him or saying bad things about him or backbiting him. Sahih. What we have been instructed with is to judge to that which is apparent. That's the only thing that we can judge. So if it's apparent that an individual is a righteous person comes to the masjid, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can see that the righteousness is pretty apparent on him. You harming him, as the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said in a hadith al-Qudsi, مَنْ عَادَ لِي وَلِيًّا فَقَدْ آذَنْتُهُ بِالْحَرْبِ Whoever shows enmity to my wali, to my close servant, and a wali can also be translated as a saint. There are people who are walking on the face of this earth that are the closed, beloved servants of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will start a war with these individuals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will start a war with these individuals. Right? So we judge from that which is apparent. And based off of that, right, we are extra careful. And the reason why I say extra careful is because we shouldn't be doing that to anyone anyway, from the Muslims. Whether it may appear that he's righteous or not. Answer your question? Yeah? Or did I miss something out? I feel like I may have missed something out from your question. So, so, and by yeah. being here today, subhanAllah, I feel that that has confirmed something that I didn't know, but for that, subhanAllah. Yeah, this is what you just mentioned. The more an individual is righteous or higher in the eyes of Allah, Azza wa Jal, right? Backbiting him, slandering him is far worse. And this is what Imam Nawi, rahmatullahi alayhi, mentioned. The quote, and I don't know if I mentioned his name, maybe I may have forgotten. When he said, وَلِذَٰلِكَ تَغَلَّطَتِ الْغِيبَةُ بِحَسَبِ حَالِ الْمُؤْمِنِ Right? The ghib is worse depending on the situation of that believer. وَكُلُّ مَا كَانَ أَشَدَّ اسْتِقَامَةً كَانَ اغْتِيَابُ أَشَدَّ The more steadfast he is, the more worse the ghib is. Imam Nawi rahmatullahi alayhi mentioned that. In his explanation of Sahih Muslim. Um, the brother, yeah. I have to give another lecture. Allah love us, inshallah ta'ala. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, not only you. Zbakallah khair. Ah,
تفضل اي سلام يعني يحافظ ان كتاب الله هم شفت القران دي نوع ها لا لا بس اي تفضل next time i see you you have to memorize half of the quran right so if they invite me over next week you have to have it ها تفضل ان شاء الله Very good question. So the brother is asking, you may do certain things that protect you from the punishment of the great. And at the same time, you may do the things that, like the things that we mentioned today, which brings about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know that whatever sin you commit, as long as it doesn't take you out of the fold of Islam, right? Which sin takes you out of the fold of Islam? Shirk and kufr, right? Disbelief and also shirk. If an individual had a tawheed, right? He testified that no one had the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah. And he lived by that, not just somebody who claims it with his tongue and then goes to the graves and invokes a righteous. There are righteous people who are buried. Having said that, that doesn't give you a right to invoke them. Even the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he himself taught us when you ask, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَسَأَلِيْهَا You go directly to Allah Azza wa Jal. Otherwise, there's no difference between us and a group who may attribute themselves to Christianity. طيب. When you die and you have a tawheed, and some scholars also mention, and in fact many of them, that the bare minimum that keeps you in an Islam is what the salah. If you died upon that, even though you committed so many sins, so many sins, and from amongst the sins that you committed were these, what is the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah in this scenario? If you die like that, what is the aqidah? Huh? That you are under the, you are under the will of Allah. You are under the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal may choose to punish you for that. And he may choose to forgive you. It is Allah Azza wa Jal who forgives. However, and I thank you for asking for that. So in a nutshell, summarize, when an individual dies upon major sins, as long as he had his tawheed intact, right, he's under the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal may choose to punish him in the grave. And then, He's also punished in the hereafter, but then eventually ends up coming out of the hellfire. Because someone with a tawheed, if Allah decides to punish him, sooner or later he will come out. Having said that, that doesn't mean we start taking it lightly, right? The fire of the hereafter, my beloved brothers and sisters, it is one seventieth that we have in today's dunya. When you go into your kitchen and you touch the fire, it's one seventieth of the hereafter. So you don't want there to be even a possibility, a percentage, that you'll be touched with the fire. Right? So you're under the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? You may have the punishment lightly in the grave. And then again, on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, you have a light punishment. And that is because you came with all of these other good deeds. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, Jazakallah khair. Ahsan Allah ilayk. Completing the hadith of the one who is being lashed in the grave. Right? You prayed a prayer without tahara. Also what was mentioned in the hadith was You saw somebody being oppressed and you did not rush to his aid. You did not defend his honor. Right? 
It takes guts, brothers and sisters. Someone's being backbiting in front of you and he may be the one who's doing this filthy, evil act. Someone who's close to you. For you to stand up for your Muslim brother and say, no, this is wrong. He's being oppressed. But you do something about it. And as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, whoever defends the honor of his brother in his absence, Allah will protect his face from the hereafter, uh, from the fire. Today, in Hounslow, West London, the lecture was about your prophet is being insulted and defending his honor and so on, and how an individual goes about defending his honor. Uh, I was thinking about, and this occurred in my mind, as I was walking into the message, shall I just change the topic? And just speak about what I spoke about there. And then, um, inshallah ta'ala, it should be up on my YouTube channel, hopefully within the next 48 hours. I put pressure on them for them to put this up. What are the practical steps that we need to take in order to defend the honor of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Right? And without a shadow of a doubt, it's you learning about his sunnah. Learning the deen of Allah Azza, so you're able to protect it accordingly. And Allah Azza will always what? Protect his religion. You guys heard of Lars Vilks? Lars Vilks, a Swedish cartoonist, huh? who sketched the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the form of a dog. Swedish cartoonist. From that point on, he had what? 24 hour security. And then, subhanAllah, guess how he died? On an empty motorway, he just what? Slipped. And until this very day, they don't know how he died. And then a car exploded. They don't know until now how he died. Allah will deal with them. Just like also he dealt with Khusro, Kisra. Right? Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent him a letter. And the first thing that was mentioned on the letter was Min Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And he became furious, Kisra, Khusro the second, who was known as the king of kings in Iran and outside of Iran. He got so angry, he goes, how can this servant of mine, he's talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi try and mock him and ridicule him, right? How can he start with his name before mine? He took it, ripped it out. And then expelled the messenger, the noble companion. It was only a couple of days before his own son turned on him. He killed his own father. And then the son was killed. And then the one who killed him was killed as well. And then the whole kingdom was destroyed. This was after the Messenger made dua against him and said, Mazzaqallahu mulka. Just as he cut up this paper, this letter, may Allah Azza wa Jal do that to his kingdom, and that's exactly what happened. Allah Azza wa Jal will <coughs> preserve his Prophet's honor. Right? I think that's time, right?